Welcome to Heat Stress Management for the Northern Territory. I'm Dr. Matt Brearley from Thermal High Performance presenting this seminar on behalf of NT WorkSafe. Before we get started, a little disclaimer. To talk about heat stress, unfortunately, we need to talk about pseudoscience. It's rare that you'll actually get information direct from a scientific source. Most of it comes from colleagues, trade journals, blogs, websites, etc. And some of it, I guess, can seem scientific, but may not be, and that's pseudoscience. So something presented as science but lacks the scientific rigor, yeah, that's pseudoscience. If you hear the term scientifically formulated, it's a good starting point to put up the flag that this may be pseudoscience. It's not always true. So pseudoscience has a branch that is dominated by the males and it's called bro science. Now, it's not all about males, pseudoscience. Uh, ladies can do it as well. But in terms of bro science, I guess some work sites that may be male dominated allow non-scientific information to be spread very, very quickly. And it can be quite challenging to turn that around and prove that it's wrong. Bro science came from the supplement industry and specifically protein and the explosion of knowledge around that, branch chain, amino acids, etc. And so we've called bro science as simply claims circulated amongst the men that are not backed by science. Again, scientifically formulated is a dead giveaway. So sometimes I'm on site and I'm getting the drill on what is purported to be science. This is how we manage heat stress scientifically, or I use this supplement because it's scientifically formulated. And I feel like Woody in this image here, I'm just trying to hold the poker face, but I'm not very good at it. And look, bro science, it, it is everywhere. And we'll cut through it in this session today. We'll give you the evidence, we'll show you the papers and allow you the information access to, I guess, do some more reading do some more exploring, come up with your own conclusions based upon the evidence. I think that's critical. So what's this session look like? Well, this diagram is a really good, I guess, simplification of heat stress. And I thought it'd be good to use this for the session outline. So what we're interested in is exercise under heat stress. What are the impacts? How to manage it? What makes it worse, etc. This diagram does a pretty good job of that. So with exercise under heat stress, you've got some thermal strain, body temperature changes, you've got some fluid disturbances within the body, different compartments changing. They can have impacts on various systems of the body, which in turn translates to inferior work performance, increased symptoms, heat-related illnesses, etc. potentially impact upon safety as well as health and performance. These are important factors. Some things make them worse, and some things help mitigate these effects effects and factors. So it's areas we need to talk about it all. You'll see we as we go about. through so this session, now, I'll highlight the various work under heat stress. We need to talk about the weather because it has a big impact and we love talking about the weather in the NT. Endurance performance, work performance and also thermal strain. So let's get into it. Here we've got our crew working away building a substation. Now it doesn't really matter what they're doing. The fact they're doing physical work means they're producing body heat. The harder they work, the more body heat they will produce, which in climates that are nice and cool, and not sunny and not humid at all, generally not an issue. We can get rid of most of that heat. There's a really good gradient for our body heat to go to the environment, not in the NT. We have chronically hot, humid, sunny conditions up north, hot, extremely hot in fact, sunny conditions, and sometimes humid after rains in the southern region. Regardless, they're all challenging. So what is heat stress? Well, heat stress is that body heat trying to get out into this environment, which looks like this through a thermal lens. And so it's the net heat load to which a worker is exposed, both the heat load from the body and that of the environment. This image does a really nice job of summing it up from Sarah Carter's Honours Project 2018. You see the yellow lines. That's the heat load of the environment. You've got the orange lines, the heat trying to be dissipated from the body, and this is where the heat stress occurs, where there's very little gradient, and sometimes in extreme heat, you're actually absorbing heat from the environment, plus you've got all your body heat. 
can be very, very difficult to manage. That's why we have so much heat stress. I thought it'd be interesting to look at the weather factors, the climate factors that each independently impact our ability to do work in the NT. Let's start with ambient temperature. So ambient temperature is what you see forecast or reported in media outlets. When they say temperature, they're talking about temperature of the air, ambient temperature. In this study, you look at 20 degree heat, really, that sounds thermoneutral to me, but let's just say a 20 degree condition with 70% relative humidity. And we, these people are doing work in a lab, so not in the field, so it is shaded, and they're basically working until they cannot keep that work rate up any further. That's called time to exhaustion. It's an index of the impact of climate or weather on work. You can see 20 to 30 degree condition, a drop off in the ability to do work, time to exhaustion. It's pretty clear. I'm not too interested in the cooler uh, conditions, obviously, being a heat stress presentation. Now, why is that so important? Well, ambient temperature is forecast in this season, November to January, to be much higher than normal. And regardless of the season, it really doesn't matter about the forecast so much. We know we're going to be exposed to extreme heat, heat and humidity, high solar loads at some point on a seasonal basis. It's just that this season, Bomber predicting, 80% likelihood that it'll be much hotter than normal. Ambient temperature, much higher than normal. It's going to be a big factor. What about relative humidity? So here we have a 30 degree condition that is stable and it's a relative humidity that is being altered from 24% all the way up to 80%. And you can see as that relative humidity increases, the ability to do work decreases in a stepwise manner. What about solar radiation? So this is the solar load that we are exposed to. Zero solar means in shade. So a shaded condition, these people are doing work for about 48 minutes. 800 watts per meter squared, there's a massive drop off in the ability to do work. Interestingly, 800 watts per meter squared is nowhere near the peak for any of the territory. So all regions within the territory can reach over a thousand, I should say can and do, reach over a thousand watts per meter squared during the hotter months on clear days. So that's not our worst condition. And look at the stepwise reduction as that sun gets higher in the sky during those hotter months, uh, quite marked. So what we have here is the independent impact upon the ability to get the work done for ambient temperature, relative humidity, and solar radiation. But in the real world, we're generally not just dealing with one factor. It's a combination, sometimes all three. And sometimes people will put all three into a heat stress index or a thermal strain indicator, whatever you like to call it. We're part of a research group led by Dr. Yanu from Fame Laboratory in Greece, looking at the existence of these thermal stress indicators or heat stress indexes, indices, however you like to call it. Interestingly, the search has not stopped looking for the optimal indicator. It continues and probably will continue into the foreseeable future. People are seeking for a better indice one that represents air conditions better. I'll just basically detail the most popular one, the most widespread in occupational settings, and that is using a similar system to this. It's called the Wet Bulb Globe Temperature Index, WBGT for short. You can see here we have three basically sensors. This one here is ambient temperature. Now it's shielded from the sun. In this setting, People sometimes call it dry bulb because right next to it is the same sensor, but it's got a wick on it, like a cotton sock that is into a reservoir of water. And it's the water evaporating off that sensor that gives us wet bulb temperature. So dry bulb or ambient temperature, wet bulb temperature, and then you've got black globe, which represents solar radiation. So we just talked about ambient temperature, relative humidity, which can be calculated from these two and black globe representing solar radiation. So this is one sensor that can be used to basically provide WBGT as an outcome. It's not the only one. Uh, there are several. There are many actually. Here's just three quick examples. You can see in the latter two, they don't actually have this reservoir. They're calculating uh, wet bulb temperature from other means, but either way, um, simple measures to produce a WBGT index. Why is that important? I think it's important because WBG, WBGT sorry, is used to help manage workers in the field. Now, you might use it or not. I'm not 
advocating for it, but it gives us an insight into what the conditions will be in the future. I think if you talk about hotter conditions into the future, what does that actually mean? What's it mean for our workforce? I'm going to show you what it actually means for Northern Territory workers. Based upon this great work of Associate Professor Andrew Hall from Charles Sturt Uni and his research team, we were involved in the early stages of this project, very, very keen to get great data and this group was able to provide it. So WBGT has various classifications and they're colour coded 0 through to 5. We need a baseline for conditions and 1995 provides that baseline for the study. So basically we're looking at January, mid-afternoon, an average condition with 3 metres per second of wind speed, that's about 10 odd kilometres an hour. And you can see across Australia and the Northern Territory there's various colour codings. The yellow represents WBGT category 3, green 2, grey 1. What does that mean? Well, let's have a look. Based upon those colour codings and how hard you're working, because remember, the harder you work, the more heat you produce, the harder it is to dissipate that heat. We've got easy, moderate and hard work here. Based upon the classification of WBGT, there's recommended work to rest cycle. So you can see easy work in the grey condition here for the southern region of the NT, no restriction. No restriction on moderate work, however hard work you can see, it's 40 on, 20 off as recommended by WBGT. What about the other colours? You can see there's a stepwise reduction as the conditions get more challenging from a thermoregulation point of view, the ability to do work will go down to compensate for that. So if we go into green or even yellow, which is the majority, actually all the top end in that 1995 scenario in 50, you can see we've got 40 minutes on, 20 off for that moderate work rate. In the green, it's 50 and 10. It all gets a bit confusing when you're talking about these numbers. I, look, I like to look at workability. Workability is simply the amount of every hour workers can do their task based upon WBGT flick the switch and you can see we've now got a percent to represent that. It makes it a bit simpler. So you can see 67% in that moderate work scenario for the top end during those January conditions. So what happens into the future? We can look at workability and get our head around it that way. Speaking of the future, 2050 and 1995 basically equally span 2023. So we're basically halfway between 1995 and 2050. So looking at 2050 on one of the worst scenarios um, that are out there currently, there's a massive change. So from 1995 with yellow on the top end to red and black, central region having predominantly gray and green to green and yellow, there's a change. And so if you look at the moderate work in the uh, 67 percent per hour range in 1995 while well, 2050 that looks different 50 to 33 see the impact upon the ability to get the job done 2070 is even worse as you would expect so this is yeah a worst case scenario but it's one that needs to be planned for and considered in terms of how we're going to get the job done in the NT going forward remembering that we're halfway between these two at the moment thankfully we've had a look at that through this work led by Associate Professor Andrew Hunt of Queensland University of Technology. What we've done here is model how long it would take to reach a core temperature of 38 degrees over the various climate scenarios. Now the tricky bit with these graphs is that it's already difficult to get the job done as it is in Darwin. So the amount of time it takes before core temperature gets to 38 degrees, it doesn't take very long. So this graph is kind of hard to read. So we've done a cheat sheet and provided numbers. So you can see the 95, 20, 50, 20, 70 model data in terms of minutes at different work rates to achieve that 38 degrees. And these data reflect the climate scenarios and the challenge we were talking about previously that the job will get harder to do. And so less amount of work to reach a threshold temperature without any additional control measures. So yeah, that points us in a direction that we'll talk about shortly regarding controls. So let's talk about the impact upon various bodily systems, including the risk of exertional heat illness, and we'll need to talk about thermal strain as we do that. 
So what symptoms do workers in the Northern Territory report? Well, they're very similar to symptoms reported by workers in WA and Queensland. Exposed to heat results in similar symptoms. Now, these symptoms follow a particular trend. Fatigue is generally number one, and you've got headache and irritability generally two or three or in the reverse. But overall, the top three symptoms, the, I guess, heat hangover trilogy, we call it, is fatigue, headache, and irritability. Now, heat hangover, what's that? Well, similar to an alcoholic hangover, because when you look at these symptoms, you could probably substitute these directly for those of an alcoholic hangover, the fatigue, the headache, the irritability you have with excess alcohol consumption. Well, why wouldn't it be a heat hangover? Similar symptoms, occurs a similar way, excess heat exposure, potentially. This is what's being reported. So we gave the term heat hangover to these to this cluster of symptoms, I guess, in 2013, and we've been studying it ever since. What we're interested in is what is it, what causes it, and how to prevent it. And I think the heat hangover is the biggest issue workers face in the Northern Territory right now. So to quantify the symptoms, you can use a sheet like this. This is the Environmental Symptoms Questionnaire. A very simple tick and flick 20 to 30 seconds for most workers to complete this. So you can do this at the end of a work shift or you can do it during or whatever and uh, quantify those symptoms. So you can see here this worker in terms of symptoms has had a really good shift um, with zeros throughout, a little bit of thirstiness and they felt hot. But when you look at their body temperature as measured by a gastrointestinal pill, a pill they consume and travels through the gastrointestinal tract and we're able to download that. Because this is the 38 degree mark I was talking about in the previous um, slide where that's a kind of a, a warm and uncomfortable body temperature, a kind of operating temperature for a lot of people working in the Territory. And time spent under that is good for health, safety and performance. Time spent over it is the reverse. I'm not saying any time over it is bad. That's not the case, but spending less time up in the, in the 38, especially the 38 and a half, which is designated in the gray area here. Uh, that's definitely an area considered hot and uncomfortable, pushing up towards uh, heat stroke beyond this limit here. Definitely spending less time up there is, is good. So look at this next worker. We've lost some of these zeros here. You can see there's a, a bit of a trend towards a little bit of grumpiness, muscle cramp, tiredness, goosebumps and chills, somewhat weak feeling much thirstier and extremely hot, and that would be because this body temperature. So the symptoms will be individual, we're all different, and the same body temperature pattern for a different worker doesn't result in exactly the same symptoms. But as a general trend, the more orange on these graphs, the more symptoms we get with that accumulation of body heat. And you can see there's definitely some time spent above 38. There's even uh, time spent over 38.5, up into the 39 degree range, which is not something I'm keen to see. This is one of the worst heat hangover curves we've seen. If you see the bulk here and here, both first and second half of shift for an underground miner, this is way too much time spent over that 38 degree mark. So th two thirds of shift. Um, yeah, even getting up to 38.8, but 38.8 does not tell the story. Neither does 11% of the shift over that 38.5 threshold and in the gray area. It's the amount of time spent over that 38 degree line that uh, for me, explained the heat hangover, severe heat hangover of this worker on this day. You could look at the previous graph where we had a worker at 39 degrees and you might say, well, this worker here is at greater risk of heat-related illness. However, I would argue that it's the accumulation of body heat, which is something we don't really look at. In other areas, you might look at the accumulation of noise exposure for a worker or exposure to chemicals as an area under the curve. I think heat is a candidate for that as well. And I think it's accumulation of heat given that Northern Territory serves up hot conditions. Uh, basically, as soon as we get to work, um, many of us are heat exposed already early in the shift right throughout. It's that heat exposure that accumulates that I think helps explain symptoms across the work shift and particularly after the work shift in the home or work camp environment. What is the impact of living and working in the NT? Some brilliant research 
just released by Dr. Simon Quilty. So he looked at the temperature at which people die and related that to the heat health impact. So what is the impact of the environment on someone's health? And this is one way to look at that heat health trend. So you look at the maximum temperature on day of death, I know it's quite a bit of a dark topic and a different way to be quantifying how heat impacts a population. Uh, but the average over the few days around that death of the maximum temperature and you see the trends here. Now we've got data for what's called the arid zone, so more the southern region of the NT, and you can see as temperature increases beyond that high 20s, uh, there's a steep rise in deaths. And then you look at the humid zone, which is more the top end of the Northern Territory, the northern region, and you see here's a very steep rise, noting that high temperatures and exposure to extreme heat is less likely um, and ambient temperature has its limitations in this regard but yet there's still from that high 20 degree mark a steep increase in uh, the deaths when temperatures are high and it's really clear that despite being a heat acclimatized and heat hardened uh, population those are exposed to heat that is um, heat has a profound impact upon residents of the Northern Territory, despite all those years of knowledge and experience in dealing with it. Heat has a direct impact as well. We might call the previous data from Simon's work as an indirect uh, effect, indirect evidence. Well, there's obviously direct evidence here where heat stroke is a risk, and it is. Uh, heat stroke is quite infrequent, uh, but does occur, and our conditions are very conducive to it. And the symptoms you'll see during a heat stroke are quite well described, I guess you would call it. Um, so people say headache and fatigue, weren't you just talking about that with a heat hangover? Now we're talking heat stroke, that doesn't make sense. Profound, the term profound means a lot here. Uh, the inability um, to think because your headache is so profound, the inability to perform physical work because you're so profoundly fatigued, they are very different. Um, a lot of people pick me up on this one as well, vomiting. I think vomiting could be up a lot higher if this was a, a cascade from less serious to most serious, yeah, sure. And I think vomiting is not seen as a symptom of uh, heat stroke in the Northern Territory. I've seen uh, in a lot of sporting settings and work settings where vomiting is just disregarded as a symptom at all. Um, that's not the case, it is quite serious. Now, heat stroke should never occur in a workplace. It's 100% preventable. It should be picked up at the latter stage during heat exhaustion because you'll see these symptoms before you see the heat stroke ones. So weakness, fatigue, irritability, and dizziness. These are the, the three, I think, that are quite visible. Others can be, of course, and everyone will be different. And what you're looking for is abnormalities. So a change in behavior, a change in the way someone communicates, the way they carry their body, the way they move. Um, there will be a difference between a normal worker, that heat affected version, and someone suffering heat exhaustion and heat stroke. And you're looking for that abnormality and you need to catch it well before a heat stroke stage. It's very, very difficult to manage in a resource limited setting um, having a heat stroke in the middle of uh, a work site. So yeah, we need to prevent that. And we do that by keeping eyes on and looking for these symptoms. So surveillance is the key. So how would you manage a heat stroke if it was to occur? Obviously we're going to prevent that, but if it was to occur, what would you do? Well, there's been a bit of misinformation and a bit of confusion in this space. And I basically brought that to bear in this paper here where I criticized uh, the recommendations given uh, to Australian organisations and workforces more broadly to manage heat stroke. I think we've been quite behind the times assuming that uh, certain methods that aren't backed by evidence uh, will get it done and I don't think they will and the evidence suggests that they definitely won't. Our Australian guidelines from the Australian Resource Council, which is now merged with New Zealand to be the Australian and New Zealand Council on Resuscitation, up until 2020, it was showing information like this. And this is all fine. Heat stroke is a life-threatening condition. Yep, call for an ambulance, resuscitate, doctors, ABCD, place the victim in a cool environment. That, that's all fine. But uh, moistening the skin with a moist cloth or atomizer spray and assuming that the cooling through that evaporation in our climates will remedy an extremely high core body temperature with heat stroke? Probably not. The evidence says it won't. And so we're dealing with 
core temperatures above 40 degrees, in some cases above 41, above 42, and we need to get that worker cooled down to 39 degrees within half an hour. 30 minutes is not a very long window, and some people call it the golden half hour for heat stroke treatment. So we're moistening the skin and, and fanning repeatedly get it done? Uh, I don't think so. And what about the ice packs on the shallow arteries, neck, groin, armpits? Data out there in research settings suggests that they won't get it done either. And so writing that paper in 2019, uh, I highlighted this. And with the view to urge the Australian Resource Council, as it was called at that point, into altering their guidance material. Um, basically, the guidance material was due for a review in 2020. They reviewed it and they updated it. So this is what's out there now, and this is fairly well. We can look at this NSCORE guideline 9.3.4. If you look that up, freely available, you'll be able to see this. I've just simply cut and paste. The heat stroke 4.2 on this side of the screen, that's from the 2016 version. Again, that's still out there as a legacy document. You can get hold of that as well. So, lie the person in a cool environment or in the shade, loosen and remove excessive clothing, send for an ambulance if not approving quickly or good. While waiting for professional assistance for individuals over five years of age, immerse whole body from the neck down in cold water. That's very different to what we see over here. And that's a substantial change from the 2016 to the 2020 document. Saying in a bath, if possible, as cold as possible for 15 minutes. Internationally, that's generally two degree water, which would have ice floating on top of it. And I'm not suggesting that workplaces should provide that type of means to restore a normal body temperature for a heat affected worker. It can be quite challenging to manage an airway in water. Lifting a person to place them in a bath, if you're working um, basically with a colleague and it's one-on-one -on -one in terms of treatment, well, it's very difficult. But the next point is quite interesting. So we're talking about application of cool or cold water. And that seems achievable for a lot of people. They say under a shower or safe or a hose or other water means. They do still recommend ice packs and moisten the skin and fan continuously. Uh, I think that's all fine. But if you're relying on those methods solely, uh, I think you might be caught short. I definitely think cold water, based upon the evidence and what the research states, is the key here. I should note that I'm not a first aid trainer. I'm simply providing you with information to consider the most appropriate heat stroke treatment for you, your workplace, and outside of work as well, and reflect on this information. So again, I will urge you and point you to ANSCOR guideline 9.3.4 as a starting point on your journey in this space. So what are others doing and how are they achieving cold water application on a heat affected person in the field? We've talked about how hot it is in the Northern Territory. Well, where do you get cold water? From Maine's, typically water is not cold uh, when it's hot. So when the conditions are warm, it's most likely when we're getting these heat strokes. So in the southern summer and in the northern wet season, uh, Maine's water is definitely not cool and not suitable to be cold enough for a heat stroke treatment. So some organisations are providing the means to provide cold water to the body of a heat affected worker. And here we have a local organisation with a 22 litre esky. They've got towels in the various vehicles, in the trucks and the LVs, and there's ice and water in there to dunk those towels to apply over the torso of a heat affected person should they need it. So the towels are simply cotton material that is holding that cold water against the skin to allow it to absorb heat. Those towels will warm up. Those towels will then be placed back in the icy cold water slurry and back on to the heat affected person. And they'll continue to provide cooling while ever there is cold water available. So this is simply a pre-hospital cooling method to drop the body temperature while medical support is on route. Here's another example from a workplace. Uh, basically a bracket's been uh, fabricated here onto this vehicle, which is for an underground mine. There's several of these vehicles that are work vehicles. They're not specified as an emergency response vehicle, but because they'll be in that underground environment moving around, they'll be there um, should there be a heat stroke in that workplace 
ready to um, be used as a means to cool. There are towels in uh, the front of the cab to be dunked in that water. We've had these towels used recently. Uh, we've just submitted a paper on this with my colleague Shane Rogerson in total suspected heat exertion, sorry, exertional heat stroke, a case study work of cooling hot and humid environment. So in that case, uh, the ice cold towels were used. Uh, basically, the paramedics who arrived on site um, stated that those towels being used for a 15 to 20 minute period prior to their arrival likely saved um, that worker's life. And so this is how important it can be. Yes, we will do everything we can to prevent. Heat strokes should never occur, but should it occur, there needs to be a management plan and cooling needs to be a key part of that plan and how you can cool in a resource limited setting is yeah is something that needs to be considered we're putting forward consideration of ice cold towels as a both cost effective and evidence-based method to get it done regardless of the setting moving on to mitigating factors We've got hydration and cooling that we'll talk about. Heat acclimatization, I can't do it justice in the time allocated, so we'll have to admit that. And we've got hypohydration. So hypohydration is probably what you know as dehydration. Just for terms sake, dehydration is a process of having a fluid deficit and hypohydration is having a fluid deficit. So one is on the way there and the other has basically got you arrived there. I use them interchangeably in the workforce because I don't think it's that important to designate either or. It's a little bit confusing. So let's just talk about hypohydration and dehydration interchangeably for the purpose of this presentation. How is heat managed? Okay, so most of you will know that hydration is one of the key ways that people are managing their workplace heat stress and workplace heat exposure. And it was confirmed in this study that was conducted in 2012, published in 2015. So it was a survey conducted at the Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists conference in LA 2012. And one of the survey questions was, what measures are adopted in the workplace or workplaces that you consult in during very hot weather? So these are the controls that were listed. 180 people replied to the survey, so it was 180 I guess workplace safety professionals, you could call them. Only two are from the Northern Territory, so we really need to do better with that. And I'm assuming there's far more people from the NT attending these type of conferences now. That's what I see anyway, so that's great. Um, more will obviously be better. So of those 180, almost all ticked provision of cool drinking water as one of those control measures, and over two thirds ticked shady rest area. So let's have a look at those two. Let's start with hydration, it's such a big topic. Uh, so much of the heat stress management that is done is all around hydration. So what does the research say about this? So if you say provision of cool drinking water is a control measure, why do we do that? Well, studies in workplace settings, according to Carter and Muller, have identified dehydration as a significant risk factor for heat illness due to impaired dissipation of body heat. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's a pretty reasonable summary of what the data shows. And here's one of those studies performed by two giants in the field, Scott Montaigne and Ed Coyle. Back in the day, they didn't have core temperature pills as readily available as we do now. So temperature was measured in a different way, but they're both uh, basically comparable. So they're both valid indices of core body temperature. So here we have body temperature going up. Why is it going up? Because there's a group of people here exercising at around two thirds of their maximum. So it's fairly moderate to high work rate here. And they're doing it in 33 degree heat, ambient temperature, 50% humidity, no solar radiation, but those conditions are difficult enough. And you can see when they don't consume any fluids, we've got open white circles to represent their body temperature. We're getting up to around 39 plus here, which is pretty hot hot and uncomfortable for sure. The squares that are colored in represent the same trial when 20% of sweat losses are consumed. So they're putting back some of the fluid. So if they were losing a liter an hour, they'd be putting back 200 mils per hour in that condition. And you can see there's a, a small impact on body temperature. When you put back 50% of sweat losses, 
That's a substantial and significant drop in body temperature, core body temperature that is, between the no fluid trial and the 50%, and there's even more of a drop when you do the 80% trial, which is putting back almost all of your sweat losses. So what we see here is that in a stepwise manner, increased fluid consumption blunts the rise of core body temperature. Importantly, it doesn't stop it going up. Note that all of them have gone up from approximately 37, 37.1, uh, but these, uh, these trials here where they've consumed 80% of their sweat loss as well, the body temperature's gone up less. Okay, so it blunts a rise. A lot of people jumped on this data and went, hydration, hydration, hydration. And this is part of why. It's not just the only study. There's several that came out around this time. And they all build upon each other, and they're all very similar in terms of more fluid consumption results in a blunted rise in core body temperature. But the key point here is it doesn't stop it going up it does not stop the rise of core body temperature. What are we trying to do here? We're trying to minimize core body temperature during our heat exposure while we're working. So any help through hydration is well received. And yes, this is a positive outcome. I'll never state that dehydration is acceptable. I'll always seek for workers, athletes, anyone exposed to heat to be hydrated because this is a healthy outcome. But let's not pretend it's going to solve heat stress. And too many people rely on hydration as their key control, sometimes their sole personal control, as a way to mitigate the impact of heat. And they wonder why workers are reporting heat hangovers in the numbers they do. And some of these workers will drink 8, 10, 12 litres of fluid across their shift. And based upon that, you would assume that they don't have any heat-related symptoms, but they still do. And then some people say, well, yep, you drunk a lot, that's great, but you haven't drunk enough, you're still dehydrated. And look, maybe they are. Maybe they are. But how much is going to be enough? Would 15 litres be enough? We're talking about substantial fluid consumption, shift in and shift out. What are we trying to do here? Drop the body temp. So let's be hydrated, but let's also cool and not just rely on hydration. Or I'd say let's not over rely upon it. It blunts the rise, it doesn't stop the rise. Let's not pretend it does. So what about the other research? What, what are they saying? Well, not everyone's as measured as Carter and Muller. So here we have maintaining adequate hydration is the single most important strategy, single most important strategy to counteract the effects of thermal stress. Wouldn't cooling the body be the single most important strategy? I think this is a stretch. This sounds a bit of that pseudoscience to me. And then drinking early and often is not and not simply in reply to thirst is generally regarded as crucial to controlling heat stress. Again, it sounds like an over-reliance on hydration. And here's the kicker. Dehydration critically increases risk of heat stress. Yes, based upon the study I showed you from a couple of slides before, yeah, you can see that. Dehydration critically increases risk of heat stress, yep. Hence, the fundamental public health message, avoid dehydration, must be broadly promoted until the message reaches community saturation. Oh, we're at saturation point. We're definitely at saturation point. Again, this is over-reliance, over-reliance on hydration or avoiding dehydration to manage heat stress. Um, yeah, this concerns me. This study should prove why I've taken the position I have because it's based upon the evidence. So this excellent work by Carter et al, published in 2005, is from data from 1980 to 2002. This is not recent. This has been out there a long time. Over those 22 years, the US Army put 5,246 of its workforce or its soldiers in a hospital for heat-related illness. Now, that is a very, very large number, and I haven't come across a data set that is comparable to this. Obviously, they have a massive workforce. They do work in extreme conditions, and they might do extreme work under extreme loads. Their uniforms, etc. But um, what can we learn from this big data set of hospitalizations? Well, unfortunately, there's a subset of those 5,000-odd soldiers that were more severe. These were heat stroke and included some deaths. So there's a proportion of the data here. These soldiers didn't make it to hospital or they never left. And with the utmost respect, we need to learn from what happened here. And I think it's fair to say, based upon some of the quotes I just read, that most of us would say, 
you'd be dehydrated. You'd have to be dehydrated to be a heat stroke victim. Suffer the worst of the worst heat related illness and have such high body temperatures up above 40, 40.5, 41, 42 degrees. How could you get there if you're hydrated? Bunting the rise in your core body temperature. But if you look at the data here, out of those 946, 160, only 160 were dehydrated, which equates to around 70%. So if we put 100 dots on the screen here, those 100 dots are representative of a sample of 100 of the 946. The yellow ones, those 17 yellow dots represent on average the 17 out of every 100 that will be dehydrated. Importantly, the green represent the 83 out of every 100 that were not considered dehydrated based upon blood tests. So very interesting. So in 2005, when this started come out, I was finishing my PhD, working with elite athletes, and I was kind of struggling with it a bit. I was in the dehydration space, but some of my data was really clear. We had athletes that were well hydrated, extremely well hydrated in some cases, yet their body temperatures were extremely high as well. And so it was their work rate and the work being done in our severe NT conditions that was explaining that rise. And being hydrated is good in terms of it can blunt the rise, but the amount of heat they were producing was just so high, it couldn't stop it from getting so elevated. So it really made me think hard. And this data here um, was basically an example to, to have a better think about things and not just be so caught up in the hydration game. And I think that's where a lot of I guess I'll be honest here, our workplace managers, uh, health safety representatives uh, are so wedded to the thought of performing hydration testing and then deeming that worker who just passed a test to be fit for work in the heat. Yet no assessment of body temperature has ever been performed. I'm not saying body temperature assessment is easy. It's not, but we can't ignore it because that's the game. We're looking at body temperature as the key variable here. Hydration is a secondary variable that modifies the rise of, body, of core body temperature. It's not the key variable. So I'll never support anyone being dehydrated while being heat exposed, whether they're working or they're playing sport, whatever. So I'm all about our people being exposed while hydrated. However, I'm not going to assume that hydration will be enough to manage a heat stress. Let's be clear, hydration management does not equal heat stress management. There are examples in the data as well. So if you look in the literature, this case report, high work output combined with high ambient temperatures caused heat exhaustion in wildland fire, despite high fluid intake. Again, we're talking about severe conditions to be doing work in and doing hard work in those conditions. Producing the heat, not able to dissipate it, high core body temperature despite high fluid intake. And this data from Mark Schechner's group, University of California, Davis, Impacts of weather, work rate, hydration, etc. You look at the data there, it was the weather and work rate. Again, the weather determining how much heat could be lost, the work rate determining how much is being produced. Hydration was not the key factor. It would have modified the core temperature curve, but those other factors of the weather and the work rate were more dominant in the field in that study. This data is out there. It continually gets ignored by those who are wedded to hydration as being the primary control. Hydration is tricky because there is so much of this bro science, pseudoscience out there. So what should you do? I think it's really simple. Based upon the evidence, I think you need access to fluids to consume it. It's a bit of a no brainer, right? If you don't have access, you can't consume fluids. So having it close by, ideally within arm's reach, if your water container or fluid container is on an LV and that LV is remote from you or not close, then how can you consume fluids? So you're set up to be dehydrated if you don't have your fluids close by, but at what temperature should you consume them? Whatever temperature you prefer. I've been told a lot of stories, most of them based upon personal feelings about drinking cold water, drinking warm water, room temperature water. To be honest, I don't really care what fluid temperature you or anyone else prefers. I think you should just go with what works for you. I think it's important to provide workers with the means to make cool water or cool fluids because the study by Sarah Carter showed that across the top end, the Kimberley and far north Queensland, let's just call it Northern Australia, uh, that 54% of workers sampled in the survey designated cool beverages as their preferred. 
32% said cold beverages was their most preferred. So that's 86% preferring cool or cold fluid. You could call it chilled fluid. It's the vast majority. Um, so regardless of your own personal preference, as long as the workers have the means to make cold fluid, I think job done there. In terms of what actually happens on site, uh, I've had some issues here uh, with pseudoscience. I was on a large work site and I was about to do some work and education with over a thousand workers for a contractor. And I walked past uh, a room and there's you know, 20 odd males sitting around um, with all cups of fluid in front of them but not really doing much. And I, I didn't know whether I was late to present my seminar. Are they, are they my guys? Am I presenting to them? No, no, no. The health and safety manager said, no, no, we're, we're in here. We've got plenty of time. We set up and having plenty of time, I thought, well, I might go and have a chat to the crew. And so I said, what, what's the go there? They failed their uh, lunchtime hydration test, mid-shift hydration test. Cool, do you mind if I go and have a chat to them? And thought, yeah, go for it. G'day crew, what's going on? And no one's really interested in talking to me, but uh, I can be quite annoying, so I finally get there. And I'm like, so what, what's the go? Why aren't you consuming? So you failed your test, but why aren't you consuming fluids? Oh, they make us drink this this um, yeah, room temperature water, warm water. I'm like, uh, okay, why is that? Oh, I'll hydrate you quicker. I'm like, oh, is that right? Is that, well, yeah, it's scientifically proven. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Scientifically proven, so alarm bells are going off, pseudoscience, bro science officer. So that's uh, interesting, I'm a scientist, this is kind of my area, so talk me through it. He said, oh, I don't know, I'll about to go speak to the health and safety manager. So I did. I left the room, went back, and said, uh, this is what the crew are saying, and yep, it's scientifically proven, that's what we do. So one good thing, the crew definitely listen um, to the manager, but they're listening to misinformation. And I said, actually, that's not true. That's not true. And it got to the point where I was being asked, where's your evidence? I said, well, this paper and this paper and this paper clearly, clearly show that Gastric emptying, the rate at which fluids or food are emptied out of the gut and into the intestines for absorption are really not affected by temperature at all. If you want to change how quickly fluids are emptied out of the gut, you want to increase it, you would drink more and increase that intragastric pressure. If you want to slow things down, a lot of protein, a lot of sugar, etc., the processing would slow uh, that beverage release out of the gut into the intestines. But in terms of temperature, there's very, very little fluctuation there. And it came back to the, no, where's your evidence? I'm like, well, these papers, I can get them for you. Just, I'll jump on PubMed and, and find them now. And this is, no, I was being questioned. Like, I needed to have them on me, like a hard copy. Where's your evidence? So we got to the point where I was told I'm not to mention this fluid beverage temperature to the workers. And it's not something I was willing to accept. I'm like, no, we need to tell them. This is the truth. It's about the truth. They should know this. And it got to the point where we would not continue um, to present. So basically, out back out to the car park, pack it up and leave site. And it was really disappointing not to um, miss out on uh, that contract, but to miss out on the opportunity to steer these workers back on track with their hydration and to have them understand that you don't have to sit there and take two hours to rehydrate because you don't like that fluid. You can drink whatever temperature you want and achieve it. Um, hence, I wrote the paper um, to establish that. So. I really don't get asked where's my evidence now. I'm assuming some people know that I'm going to drop this hard copy uh, on the desk and prove them wrong. But have a look, um, see what you think. The evidence is all there. Make your own judgment as always, uh, but do it based upon the evidence. So we've got access to fluids at the temperature you want and you could have it at the flavour you want. And look, there's all sorts of flavouring out there. I'm not going to talk about it now. A lot of people know that I love talking about electrolytes and how a variety of drinks out there are purported to be packed with electrolytes. Read the packaging, packed with electrolytes. And you'll see that full cream milk generally has far more electrolytes than any of these um, so-called workplace hydration beverages or electrolyte beverages. Again, do your own research there. Um, we really don't have time to get into it. What we do need to get into is cooling because this is where it's at. We're gonna be hydrated and we're gonna be cool and that's how we're gonna help manage heat stress of the workforce. Now remember that in that study done in Adelaide in 2012 and published in 2015, 69% of the respondents said shady rest area as a control for very hot conditions. Well, we just published research on that looking at passive rest. That's our, I guess, shaded rest we, we're talking about. Basically seated rest in a shaded area and the cooling rates conferred. The cooling rates are not great. That's a spoiler alert, they're not great. And look, resting in shade 
is definitely not a great way to cool down. It's better than resting in full sun. But let's have a look here. Going back to the WBGT classifications, because in the paper we looked at, there was about 13 papers in the systematic review where people were wearing clothing while doing their resting. And so that clothing varied in terms of insulation, but it considered all these studies to be either workplace clothing or more insulative. And you can see while cooling, the regardless of the condition, whether it's really, really hot, humid, etc., or in category one, uh, the cooling rates were poor per 10 minutes. You're really not doing a lot to drop body temperature, hence why other cool areas and other control measures are required. Just giving our crews access to cool water and shaded rest breaks in the NT, I really don't think it's going to be enough. And particularly now and into the future, I think they'll be shown to fall well short of the mark. So let's look at what they do in elite sport. How do they manage? Because we've got some really tough conditions, as you can see here. This is a training run for the Australian Rugby League team, the national representative team known as the Kangaroos. 37 degrees, 51% humidity on a Wednesday afternoon into a Friday night test match being played in Darwin. So this is a really good opportunity to trial cooling methods for uh, these athletes and to basically allow them to become accustomed to their preferred cooling methods and for me to assess whether they're going to be enough to manage heat stress in the severe conditions expected. So in November, playing rugby league in the top end, probably not the best idea in terms of heat stress and you can see why. So we've got two athletes here. These are both forwards. These are um, big athletes and once they get hot they're quite difficult to cool down. The slope of this curve suggests a high work rate and at around the 23 minute mark this athlete is substituted and this athlete has gone on and you can see the cooling rate is quite steep here for this athlete because they've hopped in a pool of water so they cool water over their torso and having slushies etc to drop their body temperature down substantially to 37 degrees at approximately the start of the second half. This worker here did not uh, undertake anywhere near the same amount of cooling. They really just had aircon exposure during the halftime period. And you see very different cooling effect here. What we've got is someone who's a one and a half to 1.6 degrees warmer at the start of the half time. And it's interesting to have a look at the response in the second half. Who would you rather be? Would you rather be a person with this body temperature or this one here? And reaching 40 degrees at the end of the second half, it's pretty clear that that would be extremely hot and uncomfortable as noted by um, that athlete. And I think the interesting point for me here is that 39.4 degrees in the first half for this athlete, having played about 23 minutes, because they started quite warm. When you look at their second half body temperature, they did not get anywhere near as hot despite playing longer. That to me is quite powerful data. Why are we talking about this? Well, half time for these athletes, 20 minute break, that could be a crib break for a workforce. And what would you rather do? S sit in shade and have very minimal drop in body temperature or have a substantial drop? Now, I'm not suggesting we're gonna have cool water baths for workers to enter and drop their body temperature, but the mentality of using breaks to address the key issue, which is their body temperature, as well as rehydrate, refuel, have good quality food, etc. I think that's really important. This is a concept that I think can be shared amongst workers, and I think they'll get it. I think they do get it. So how can they cool down? Well, the first study ever published in an occupational group looking at slushies was done by us in 2014, led by Dr. Anthony Walker. So you've got a group of 25-odd firefighters here starting their work bout with a relatively cool body temperature and then getting up to 38.9 after 20 minutes of work. They're in a fire cell, they're dragging weighted um, dummies through an area of heat and smoke and low visibility, all within, with self-contained breathing apparatus on site. Very, very stressful. That's why body temperature gets so high. To cool them down, they can hop in cool air, so air conditioning and have a cool drink and down to 38.1. It's okay, but it's not great because this amount of heat is what was stored during their first bout. If they were to repeat that and store the same amount, then we're off the screen. And hence why firefighters after two cylinders of self-contained breathing apparatus work generally require a rehabilitation period to lower their body temperature such that they're able to re-enter the fire scene. What if we did it differently? What if we're able to drop their body temperature back down to here? 
That was achieved with another 25 firefighters starting at the same temperature, attaining the same temperature during the work, but instead of cool air and a cool drink, it was cool air and a slushy, approximately half a litre of slush, which is a crushed ice drink. The melting of the ice in the body requires a phenomenal amount of body heat. We've been talking about the challenge of dissipating that heat. There's a lot of body heat being produced. The environment is very hot, humid, sunny, whatever it is. For these workers, they've got turnout gear, which is preventing the heat from the fire penetrating through that barrier onto the body, but it also prevents the heat being produced from escaping, hence why we get such a steep rise in body temperature within just 20 minutes. They have to have a similar drop in body temperature and melting of that ice in the body because they're so hot and because so much of that body heat is absorbed by in that reaction, that creates a heat sink and provides a pathway for that heat out of the body over and above that provided by aircon and a cool drink. So it's quite powerful. How do workers in the NT do it? Well, if you've got access to an inverter, a blender, ice and water, you, you can make this in the field and this is what some of our crews do in the NT, in this workforce. Generally it varies year to year, but the workforce surveys state around 35 to 40% annually use this method at least once a week during the hot weather. And so here we've got a worker making three slushies, there's about 700 mil there. And there are two workers in an elevator work platform that have come down. This worker's making three slushies for him and those two cool down and get back to work. Um, I think it's a really decent tool and something that can be thought about in terms of your heat stress mitigation. Obviously access to aircon and, and other factors are important, but in terms of cooling, bang for buck, slushies are quite a powerful tool. Something for you to think about, do some more reading, etc. Let's wrap it up. I think the key points are that we've got to avoid this. There's so much misinformation or semi-true information out there regarding heat stress. I don't think it's acceptable, particularly not for people based in the NT. It's just our conditions are too severe to be doing stuff that mightn't work or we believe to work but doesn't. So with the conditions already harsh and becoming more challenging, we really need to step it up. We've got an issue already with heat hangovers. They're so common. Um, speak to your workforce about them. If they're being honest, I, I think they'll admit, while they don't report them, um, that they're happening a lot. This hydration focus, shaded rest breaks, yes, okay, they have their place. Uh, but if we really need to address core body temperature during that medium to heavy work during hot conditions, then it's gonna take more than shaded rest breaks and hydration. Let's not pretend hydration management is heat stress management, it's clearly not. We need some cooling in there. And speaking of cooling, it's a good time to review your heat stroke management plan because for that to be effective, you will need some rapid cooling readily available to your workforce. We've put forward that ice cold towels provide the best cooling rate based upon the evidence and the practicality and its cost effectiveness as well. Have a think about that. If you're after more information, we produce a heat stress e-bulletin. You can sign up to it here. We do that on a monthly basis during the warmer parts of the year. So generally around six, on an annual basis. There's quirky information regarding heat stress, research updates, interesting information from the field. It might be worth a while having a look at that. And lastly, I'd like to thank NT WorkSafe for their support and for hosting this seminar. Cheers.